Well, good morning, good morning, beloved church family. Stephanie and I here at Walking Worthy Ministry take this opportunity to welcome you all as we savor and enjoy a blessed fellowship together. Family, friends, church family nearby, brothers and sisters around the globe, and our first time visitors. We here at Walking Worthy Ministry trust that the message, the word from God, and the songs today will uplift your spirit and encourage each of you as we share together in fellowship. May your burdens be lifted today and may you feel comforted as the Lord reveals to you your plans and purpose in your lives. And we pray that you be inspired and encouraged to become more active and involved in ministry and serving for the Lord. In the book of John, chapter 15, verse 5, it says this, Yes, I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who remain in me and I in them will produce much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Let us get started today with our weekly nursing facility roll call. In National City, California, we want to say good morning to our family at Castle Manor Nursing and Rehab Facility. We want to say good morning to our family at Friendship Manor Nursing and Rehab Facility. And we want to say good morning to our family at Windsor Gardens Convalescent Center. In Chula Vista, California, we want to say good morning to our family at Frederica Manor Assisted Living and Senior Retirement Community. We want to say good morning to our family at the Canterbury Court Senior Living. And we want to say good morning to our family at Ocean View Church, Chula Vista, under the leadership of lead pastor, Logan Mabe. Down in Bonita, California, we want to say good morning to our family at Sunrise Senior Living. And down by the water at Imperial Beach, California, we want to say good morning to our family at Sun and Sea Manor. That is the facility for Alzheimer's and dementia. And of course, in San Diego, California, we want to say good morning to our family at Ocean View Church, OVC. That's our home church under the leadership of lead pastor, Steve Boshan. As always, we say good morning to the staff there at OBC, and we say good morning to the senior adult class, the Summit Seniors. So good morning to everyone, and God bless you all. As always, we celebrate birthdays. We wanna celebrate birthdays for the month of June. Anyone having a birthday in the month of June, Stephanie and I, Walking Worthy Ministry, want to extend to you a happy birthday and may God bless you all. <clears throat> the verse of the day that we're going to give you today comes out of the book of Matthew, chapter 24, verse 44. It says this, Therefore, you also must be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. Let us get started today. Would you humble yourselves as we open with a word of prayer? Heavenly Father of grace, it is by you that we are alive and healthy. We have come to your presence today and we present our bodies as a living and holy sacrifice unto you. Please accept our sacrifice 
and do bless it in Jesus' name. Your word says, there shall always be a shout of rejoicing and salvation in the tabernacle of the righteous. Let us have every cause to be joyous in you all the days of our lives. Go with us, Lord. Visit every one of us in this gathering with your wonder working power. Make us bless, make us feel, and make us be filled. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. In the book of 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 17, this is what is written. Then we who are living at that time will be gathered up along with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. This passage is the basis for the New Testament doctrine of the rapture, the catching away of believers to be with Jesus and to reign forever. The Apostle Paul's statement under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit is both dramatic and fantastic. Here, the main point is that whatever the state of the Christian, dead or alive, at the Lord's coming to take you home, that's heaven, they will always be with the Lord. And this is the great reward of heaven, to be with Jesus Christ eternally. Would you join Stephanie and I as we sing, When We All Get to Heaven. <clears throat> get ready. Here we go.
the song hymn of heaven is about believers looking forward to eternal life with God post-death. <clears throat> Death will be abolished. Tears will be wiped away. Pain will cease to exist. And we will stand face to face with our Creator, the Maker, and joining all other saints and angels bowed in prostration. We will worship God and sing about how great He is and about Jesus Christ loving ultimate sacrifice that made the forgiveness of sins even possible. In the book of Galatians, chapter 1, verse 4, it says this, In order to set us free from this present evil age, Christ gave himself for our sins in obedience to the will of our God and Father. Join Stephanie and I as we sing the song, Hymn of Heaven. How I long to breathe the air of heaven Where pain is gone and mercy fills the streets To look upon the one who bled to save me And walk with him for all eternity songs of faith we sang through doubt and fear in the end we'll see that it was worth it when he returns to wipe Stand beside the heroes of the faith With one voice, a thousand generations Sing, worthy is the Lamb who was slain And on that day, we'll join the resurrection And stand beside the heroes of the faith all oh, with one voice a thousand generations sing worthy is the lamb who was slain forever he shall reign so let it be Shout the hymn of heaven with angels and the saints. We raise a mighty roar. Glory to our God who gave us life. 
there is a great day coming when the saints and the sinners will be parted right and left. Are you ready for that day to come? That is a repeated question throughout Scripture. Are you ready? In fact, one of the major teachings of Jesus Christ was, you need to be ready, found in Matthew chapter 25, verses 1 through 13. And today I'm going to do something different as we give a message through song, which will lead into our lesson for today. In 1965, the group The Impressions had a lead singer by the name of Curtis Mayfield, who wrote a song titled, People Get Ready. Now Mayfield got his start performing with the Northern Jubilee Gospel Singers. They competed and they sang with other gospel acts in the Chicago-based area. Grounded in church music, Mayfield wrote many songs in that style, including People Get Ready. The song embodies a deep sense of spirituality and unity and hope and is based on the Word of God from various sermons that he heard at church. From a biblical standpoint, the song lyrics encourage us believers to hang on, hang on to our faith in a time of strife because the train to Jordan is on its way to deliver them to a peaceful afterlife. This song is titled, People Get Ready. to today's lesson that Stephanie and I want to share with you. Are you ready? 
It is written in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 1 through 11. Allow me to read these verses. 1. Now concerning how and when all this will happen, dear brothers and sisters, we don't really need to write to you. 2. For you know quite well that the day of the Lord's return will come unexpectedly like a thief in the night. 3. When people are saying everything is peaceful and secure, then disaster will fall on them as suddenly as a pregnant woman's labor pains begin, and there will be no escape. 4. But you aren't in the dark about these things, dear brothers and sisters, and you won't be surprised when the day of the Lord comes like a thief. 5. For you are all children of the light and of the day, and we don't belong to darkness and night. 6. So be on guard, be on your guard, not asleep like others. Stay alert and be clear-headed. 7. Night is the time when people sleep and drinkers get drunk. 8. But let us who live in the light be clear-headed, protected by the armor of faith and love and wearing as our helmet the confidence of our salvation. 9. For God chose to save us through our Lord Jesus Christ, not to pour out his anger on us. 10. Christ died for us so that whether we are dead or alive, when he returns, we can live with him forever. 11. So, Encourage each other and build each other up just as you are already doing. The passages that we're going to look at today is about planning. It is going to ask you the questions. Are we prepared? Have we planned for Christ's return? Are we ready? As we walk through the passage, we will be reminded again and again that Christ is returning. He will break into history at a decisive moment in time. The question for each one of us is, are you ready? As the Apostle Paul finishes this letter to the church in Thessalonica, there are two things Two things he wants us to understand. Number one, he wants us to understand that there are certain facts as we look to the future event in history. And number two, how we need to respond to be prepared and ready for Christ's return. Christ is returning. What do we need to know about Christ's return? First, he lays out for us the details he wants us to understand about Christ's return in the verses 1 through 3. Apostle Paul is writing about the return of Christ here, but he uses the language day of the Lord, which is different than earlier in the book. Some people see two, two stages of the coming of Christ where the church will be taken up and where Christ will come later and land on the earth as judge. Whether there are two stages or not, this takes us to that final moment when Christ will come back to earth and will descend in this day of the Lord. This language is used throughout the Bible. There's the great day, or the day of Christ, particularly in the Old Testament. There are a number of uses of this. We have to understand the background imagery that Paul wants his readers to take into consideration. And there are two things that happen on the day of the Lord. When Christ returns, he will come as a judge. 
For some, it will be a moment of judgment. They will face judgment for their sins. And for others, it will be a moment of deliverance. So the first one, judgment. <clears throat> we see this language of judgment used in the book of Isaiah, chapter, six, chapter 13, verses 6 through 9. Six, well, well, for the day of the Lord is near as destruction from the Almighty, it will come. Verse seven, therefore all hands will be feeble and every human heart will melt. Eight, they will be dismayed. Pangs and agony will seize them. They will be in anguish like a woman in labor. They will look aghast at one another. Their faces will be aflame. Nine. Behold, the day of the Lord comes, cruel, with wrath and fierce anger, to make the land a desolation and to destroy its sinners from it. For most of us, when we think of Jesus, we have this image of this warm figure who regardless of what we do, he pats us on the head and says, try a little harder, you're doing okay. We want someone to give us a hug and cuddle up with on the scary days of life. Though some of this imagery is true, Jesus is also just. And when he returns, he will come as a judge. For those who have failed to place their faith, faith in Christ, that is what this day of the Lord will mean. It will be a moment of judgment for their sins and their opposition to God. It is scary language used in Isaiah. It's the primary imagery used throughout the Bible of this coming day of the Lord. As we think about this imagery, we have to ask ourselves, are we ready? Number two, it will be a day of salvation. There is another image for the day of the Lord. It's not just a day of judgment. It's a day of salvation for those who have given their lives to Christ Jesus. The picture described in Joel chapter 2, verse 32, 2, verse 32, says this. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. For on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem, there will be deliverance, as the Lord has said, even among the survivors whom the law Lord calls. This will be their destiny. The day of the Lord for those of us who have given our lives to Christ will be a day of salvation. The salvation which we have already received will be culminated. We will be glorified and enter into eternity with Christ and other believers. A day of judgment and deliverance. I ask, are you ready? You see, the metaphors Apostle Paul uses here help us know that the day of the Lord is coming. For most of us, when we think about this coming day, it seems a lot like science fiction and outside the realm of experience. But isn't this the way Christ usually works? He feeds 5,000 and they live. He lives a sinless life. He's born of a virgin. He's raised from the dead. That's what will occur again as Christ intervenes on this decisive day in history. The metaphors are that of a thief and that of labor pains. Thieves typically come in a moment when they are unexpected. And so will Christ return be. He will come suddenly and unexpectedly. As Paul describes here, people often don't like that. 
as planners, we want to know Jesus is coming at exactly this moment in time. We have known people throughout history who have proclaimed that they know the date of Christ's return, despite Paul's words, which said, I don't need to write to you about days or times. And Jesus' word, which said that no one will know the hour or the day. So over and over, people have done this. As early as the second century, a priest thought that Christ would return in the year 500 A.D. Wrong. We have a non-Christian sect, Jehovah's Witnesses, who have predicted over and over and over again when Christ would return. First in 1914. Wrong. 1918. Wrong. 1925. Wrong. 1975. Wrong. Within the evangelical world, a man named Edgar Wisenant wrote a book called 88 Reasons Christ Will Return in 1988. Wrong. And most recently, we have Harold Camping, who predicted that Christ will return on May 21st, 2011, 2011. Again, wrong. People want a day or an hour. Christ says that is not the way it works. He will come. It will be a decisive intervention into history, but it will come like a thief, sudden and unexpected. It will also come like labor pains. When a woman is pregnant, her signs of labor, they come suddenly. She can't plan when it begins. It is unavoidable. The question for each of us is, are you ready? The only way to be truly ready for Christ's return is to give our lives to Christ. We are told that people during Paul's lifetime were saying things like peace and safety. That's what they said. People heard other people saying it. Peace and safety. That's what they spoke about. As they looked to the future, they thought, oh, everything is, it looks okay today. I don't need to concern myself with the future now. People looked to Rome as their safety. They didn't feel like they needed to be concerned with the future or what was to come. We may find ourselves in that same boat as well, as thinking things are safe. We look at our bank account, and we think that we are insulated from difficult times. We think peace and safety. But when Christ returns on the day of the Lord, the only people that will experience peace, safety, and salvation will be those who have given their lives to Christ. Those who have believed that Jesus Christ took on flesh, lived the perfect life, and rose from the dead. Salvation comes through Christ alone. And by placing our faith in Him, we can be forgiven and have salvation on this day of the Lord. These are the facts that Paul wants us to know about on the day of the Lord. How we need to respond. Focus on eternity. Paul wants us to live differently today. Because of this future reality, we see this first in verse 4. But you aren't in the dark about these things 
dear brothers and sisters, and you won't be surprised when the day of the Lord comes like a thief. The first way we respond is begin reflecting on the reality of Christ's return. We have two choices in life. One, we can live for the moment. We can live for the moment, the now. Or two, we can live for eternity. All of Scripture points us to live for God rather than the temporal things of this world. And we have to understand that Christ's return is real. And we have to consider this in how we live every day. Am I choosing to take shortcuts at work? Am I choosing to rationalize my sinful behavior because it feels good in the moment? Or do I choose to live for all of eternity? <clears throat> Our first response to understand that Christ Jesus is returning. Understand our identity. We also need to understand our identity. We see this in verse 5. For you are all children of light, children of the day. We are not of the night or of the darkness. Paul describes two different types of people. First, those who are going to face judgment. And two, those who will face deliverance. Here, we see the children of the day, light. And children of the night, darkness. Those who are children of the day will reap salvation, and children of the darkness will undergo the judgment. Understanding who we are is crucial to the way that we live. And as followers of Christ and people who live future-focused, we have to understand who we are. Our identity is that which God grants to us when we are born again. His character is given to us and his spirit is placed within us. We are the people of light and day. And we see from John chapter 8 verse 12 that this is who Christ is. It says, again Christ spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. As we think about being future focused, we have to think about what is our identity. If our identity is that of an eternal being made in the image of God, it makes sense to prepare ourselves for Christ's return. We see a close connection here between understanding our identity and our behavior. Understanding who we are indicates the way that we live. Think about it. If being a child of God is the most important part of our identity, then understanding that we are to live in a certain way should reflect that. And we see what this connection means in verses 6 through 8. And if you think about those verses, there is clear connection between our identity and our behavior. Verse 6. So be on guard. Be on your guard. Not asleep like others. Stay alert and be clear-headed. 7. Night is the time when people sleep and drinkers get drunk. 8. But let us who live in the light be clear-headed, protected by the armor of faith and love, and wearing as our helmet the confidence of our salvation. We are to be awake and sober, to be children who reflect God, unlike those who will face judgment and live as people who are asleep and drunk. 
The imagery of awake and sleep is meant to describe a person's perception of reality. You see, if we are asleep, we have no idea of what is going on around us. We are unaware. Eyes closed. When we are awake, our eyes should be open. And we should be able to see the truth. And here is the truth of eternity versus the moment. We are to be aware of the fact that Christ Jesus is coming back. We are to be sober. When the Bible speaks of being drunk, it is all about control. A person who is sober is in control of his or her actions. A person who is drunk has allowed alcohol to control the way they live. In Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18, it says, it helps us to understand this, and this is what it says. And do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. You see, it is about allowing God's Spirit to control us. It is about allowing God to control us at work, shopping, wherever. Do we have our eyes set on the moment, the now, or eternity? We see further language in these verses as well. Not only are we to be awake and sober, but we are to put on faith, love, and hope. We are to do this ourselves with these three things. These words are seen together throughout Scripture. We have a choice. Do I live for the moment, the now, or do I live for eternity? So faith, <clears throat> these three words, faith. Faith means to live with a reliance on God, to trust Him instead of ourselves, to trust in God rather than trusting in me. Love is to allow our affections to be caught up in God, where we value the things of eternity and hope. Hope is to have confidence that Christ Jesus is returning and that he will one day make everything right. If Christ is truly returning, we need to put on faith, love, and hope. And we need to put it on all day, every day. So understand your destiny. Finally, we are to understand our destiny in verses 9 through 10. 9. For God chose to save us through our Lord Jesus Christ, not to pour out his anger on us. Verse 10. Christ died for us so that whether we are dead or alive, when he returns, we can live with him forever. You see, there are two different groups of people with two vastly different destinies. First, for those who have given their lives to Christ, what awaits them is salvation. We are told that this is to live together with Jesus. It's to live in paradise with God. Secondly, on those who have not given their lives to God, what awaits them is wrath. You see, there's no gray. You are either in or you are out. So we ask, are you ready? Because Christ will return. We are ready by giving our complete lives to Christ as our Savior and Lord. We receive our final encouragement on how to respond to the day of the Lord in verse 11. In verse 11 says, so, en so encourage each other and build each other up just as you are doing 
just as you are already doing. Sorry. This is not just a personal response. It should radiate into all our relationships. We should encourage one another with the reality that Christ Jesus is coming back. It means that sin will finally be dealt with. It is encouragement because the hope of tomorrow can carry us through. Encourage others by being loving and graciously point them toward our hope in Jesus' return. Share the gospel with those whose destiny is judgment. Eternity is at stake. I'll say that again. Eternity is at stake. And Christ is coming. Are those who you know ready? For some, it will be a day of salvation. And for others, it will be a day of judgment. And so we ask you, are you ready? Are you ready? Beloved family, the truth about God, everything starts with God. Hallelujah. Everything starts with the greatness of God, the glory of God. You see, he is holy and he is just. And we need to have a sense of who God is and what he is like. So we need to know the truth about God. We, you need to understand that sin is against God, not just people. And we can't do that if we don't know who God is. The truth about sin. In Romans 3, 23, it says, For everyone has sinned. We all fall short of God's glorious standard. We have exchanged the glory of God for images. In Romans 1, 23, it says this, And exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. All of us have preferred other things to God. You see, sin is isn't just things we do. It is the way we are. We are by nature, in Ephesians 2, verse 3, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. So we start with God's glory because this defines sin. And a loving God says to you, beloved, bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the end of the earth. Everyone who was called by my name, whom I created for my glory, whom I formed and made. And that comes out of Isaiah 43, verses 6 and 7. You were created. You exist to glorify God, to make God look glorious. You were created to show God's glory, His greatness, His beauty, His worth. You see, that is our duty. Without salvation, we are all sinful by nature, and we are all under God's wrath. We have to proclaim the truth about Christ. In 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 15, it says, this is, true, this is a true saying, to be completely accepted and believed. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. I am the worst of them. You see, everything up to now is designed to make Christ and his way of salvation appear as great and beautiful and wonderful as they really are. God sent his son, his divine eternal son, to bear the punishment that we deserve. This is the heart of everything. 
There is no way we can save ourselves from sin and God's wrath. Right now, even your faith is a gift of God. And if you are reaching out to take Christ Jesus, if you are ready to have him as your Lord and Savior and treasure of your life, you are a miracle. Trust him and declare your faith to him. Welcome Jesus as your friend. In the book of Ephesians chapter 2, verses 4 and 5, it says this, 4. But God's mercy is so abundant and his love for us so great, 5, that while we were spiritually dead in our disobedience, he brought us to life with Christ. It is by God's grace that you have been saved. Would you please pray with me? <clears throat> Father God in heaven, I realize that everything that, had hap that has happened in my life has all led up to this moment. The childhood pains, even the current path I am on is full of pain. Your word promises that you will never leave the one who accepts you. And so today, God, I am ready to receive you and even with all my dirty ways. Lord Jesus, please forgive me for all of my sins. I confess everything to you. I believe that you died on the cross at Calvary for me and you rose again on the third day. Lord Jesus, I open the door of my heart to you. Come in and save me. Let your blood wash me clean as snow and write my name in your book of life today. Be my Lord and Savior. In your precious name, Jesus, I pray. Amen. Amen. Beloved family, if you just pray this prayer of surrender, praise God, praise God. Stephanie and I, all the saints, the heavenly host, we say welcome, welcome to the family of God. Yet, we remind you now that believing in Jesus Christ is just the beginning of your Christian life, of your walk. You may be asking yourself, well, what comes next? Many of us didn't know what came after we received Jesus as our Lord and Savior. We surely appreciate the tremendous steps God took to redeem us and impart his eternal life into us so that we could be born again. So what should occur ahead? Be baptized. Believing in Jesus is the inward aspect of salvation and being baptized is the outward affirmation of it. Believing and baptism, they go together. And Mark chapter 16, verse 16, it says, Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. To believe and to be so baptized are two parts of one complete step for receiving the full salvation of God. Consecrate yourself to the Lord. This means to give yourself to the Lord. In Romans 12, verse 1, it says this, so then, my brothers and sisters, because of God's great mercy to us, I appeal to you, offer yourselves as a living sacrifice to God, dedicated to his service and pleasing to him. This is the true worship that you should offer. Listen, put yourself completely in his hands and walk in his ways. Grow in his life and enjoy his salvation. It also allows God to work in us when we consecrate ourselves to him. We're going to give you a word of the week this week. It's prepared. The word is prepared. Are you prepared? 
In 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 11, it says this, For in this way there will be richly provided for you an entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. First of all, and most importantly, being ready to meet the Lord means that you have made sure of your relationship with Jesus Christ and are trusting only Him to save you, not anyone or anything else, and certainly not good works you have done. Once you have accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, being ready to meet the Lord means living in a way that pleases Him so that whenever He calls you home and knowing that that could be at any moment, you can hear Him say, Well done, good and faithful servant. God has given us His Word to tell us how to live and His indwelling Spirit to empower us to live as we should. God is for us if we are His children. He has assured us our names are written in the book of life and we won't face the great white throne judgment. He doesn't want the works of our lifetime to go up in smoke, a vapor. He desires us to have eternal rewards. So understand that God has given us every resource in Christ to live the godly life that will result in those eternal rewards because you have prepared to receive them. Beloved family, Jesus says being prepared is also very important for living the Christian life while we wait for Christ's return. The biblical approach to the future involves prayer and preparation, more than prediction and planning. And this is true whether we're talking about our personal life, the church, or the second coming of Jesus. If you go down to the beach where the wind is up, you'll see surfers out in the water catching the waves. You see, folks who truly love to surf basically do everything else in life that they have to do just so that they can go back to the water and catch that wave. Surfers do not plan waves. They prepare to ride them when they roll in. And we don't plan the future. Much of what happens to us is beyond our control. What we can do is prepare to deal with it when it rolls in. Preparing involves calling upon the Lord, coming to God in relationship, praying, seeking the Lord with all of your heart. Let's talk about prayer. Prayer is a powerful tool for every believer in Christ. It is a means of communication with God, establishing dominion on earth, and aligning yourself with God's will and His Word. You see, there's no time when prayer has been more needed than now, today. We live in a perilous, we live in perilous times. But we are not surprised or taken back by the events occurring because we know that these are the things that predate the second coming of Jesus Christ. Let's be watchful. In Matthew 26, verse 41, it says, Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. The world as we know it is coming to an end. And this is proven by the different awful events that are occurring in the world today. Many ungodly Many despicable practices have become the other of the day 
and are even nationally accepted. All believers must be watchful and be aware of the devices that the enemy sends into the world on a daily basis. We must remain firmly rooted in doing the work of God because Jesus assured us that he is returning with rewards. And there are other tools you can also use. There's Bible study. There's going to church. And there's evangelizing. Those are some other tools. So beloved family, as we close today, Stephanie and I, Walking Worthy Ministry, we acknowledged, we acknowledge what a blessed gathering. What a blessed gathering. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ here today, this joy in our heart is because God is the source of all joy and peace that has filled each one of us through our faith in Him. We want to thank you, each one of you, for helping us to finish well, to finish strong, and to praise God for the mercies that He supplies us on a daily basis. We thank you all for going the extra mile. Thank you. And for loving the loving effort that you've contributed today to the service. And may God bless us, each one of us, abundantly. In our message today, we repeated, Jesus, the King of Zion reigns, and he is coming back. We want all believers to be ready as subjects in God's kingdom and in honoring Christ as King. In the book of Revelation, chapter 19, verse 6 and 7a, it says, 6. Then I heard what sounded like a large crowd, like the sound of a roaring waterfall, like loud peals of thunder. And I heard them say, Praise God, for the Lord, our Almighty God, is King. 7a. Let us rejoice and be glad. Let us praise his greatness. And why rejoice and why praise? Because Jesus is Lord.